Good evening. Agility matters. Here we are going live with Eric Bula, uh, live from, I believe, Thailand. Is that, is that correct, Eric? Yeah, yes, I'm here in Thailand, 100%. Awesome. Uh, so how, how are things? How are you today? Very, very good. The situation is very good in Thailand since they closed the border probably 10 months ago. No COVID, life is normal. So unfortunately, I'm stuck here. Uh, I'm remote work and beach. It's a torture. Oh, that sounds horrible. <laughs> that sounds yeah. absolutely horrible. <laughs> uh, it, it's all right for some. No, that, that sounds pretty cool. Um, so obviously, Eric is a author of the book Exponential Change, uh, which I, I, I speed read for you, by the way. I speed read it in about about five or six days. So um, obviously, when we said we we could have you on the show, we're like, okay, I'm going to have to read this book. This is an awesome book, by the way. What I thought was really eye-opening to me was how similar our mindsets are. And um, I'm hoping this conversation is going to be really interesting for that reason. Um, yeah, so what, what made you write the book in the first place? So basically, I believe that companies are struggling when we talk about, for example, my enterprise agility, uh, people know very well how to do Scrum, how to coach um, IT teams, software teams, but it's very difficult to expand agility to the rest of the organization. And in order to do that, they need to understand some additional concept. And uh, when I started working around the world, I saw that people generally struggle everywhere. In New Zealand, in Australia, in Europe, in America, Latin America. So I started developing some frameworks for people to try to understand how enterprise agility works and what to do when they need to expand all these concepts outside uh, software teams. And that was the beginning of the journey. Yeah. And I noticed you used the word sustainable framework, and that really hit home for me. So why is sustainability in your framework so important? Well, let me try to show you something. Uh, I will try to share some screen with you. Hopefully it's gonna, it's gonna be cool. good. Let's do this. Let's, let's, try, let's try this live. <laughs> Hopefully it's gonna be good. We have like, I have like 10 screens here. So basically the idea when we are talking about sustainability is try to understand how leadership works in a company. And then in order to understand how leadership works in a company, I want to show you something. Let's see, it's gonna take me just one second if it works too. We were joking uh, earlier on, weren't we, Eric? We were like, <laughs> can we share a screen live on YouTube? Let's see what happens. It'll be fun. <laughs> well, if something can go wrong, is it gonna Yeah, go and we'll learn from it, right? Okay, let me, yeah, I think it's gonna, we are gonna be successful now. And these concepts are very important, especially if you are a coach and if you are trying to, let's see how it goes. You tell me how things are going now. We're, we're, we're live and everyone can see you. Uh, and one quick question is coming from Gordon, by the way. Uh, when are you coming back to Hong Kong? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. So uh, as soon as I get vaccinated, I'm going to be back to Hong Kong. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a quick and easy answer. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, all those beaches, Eric. Now. All those beaches. I mean, come on. How can you give up the beaches? I love Thailand, by the way. I, <laughs> I adore it. Yeah, it's a good place, especially at the moment. I think the situation is, is, is really good here. And then I don't think we're having any problem with COVID. So can you see my screen now, Michael? Perfect, yes, go for it. Yeah, okay, so, so basically let's try to go to the basics, how a company works. Basically the company works, we can use this quadrant that originally was developed uh, for some Kiwi guy, uh, was related to cost of delay, but I built a framework based on this. So in a, a standard company, the company needs to do four things. Then first one is increase revenue. That in here, we try to make as much money uh, as we can. And there is no science uh, behind this. The second one is about protecting revenue. If I have a customer or a group of customers, I just try to make sure they do not disappear and I look after them. Uh, we have two more options in this quadrant, which is avoid cost 
Uh, we can see that with automation, for example. I try to make sure that uh, if something is happening in the near future that I'm going to need to invest a lot of money, I try to avoid that. And finally, uh, we have reduced cost. That this is a typical thing that we generally see in companies. One of these um, things we can see is uh, when companies fire employees. In Agile, we take a different perspective. Every time, for example, we need to reduce cost, we also see if we are not destroying knowledge. As some companies start firing people uh, just to look after the numbers, and then they realize that they destroyed some um, shared knowledge, right? So what yeah. we do here is we add a different dimension, one additional dimension, which is about organizational health. And let me try to show you how it works. And we try to see a definition of what organization and uh, organizational health is. So basically what we're gonna do here is we're gonna make sure that we focus on organizational health. So every time we do something on this quadrant, we are gonna ask, is this going to increase or decrease organizational health? For example, if we are gonna reduce cost and we need to fire, I don't know, a hundred people, What's going to happen is that, in general, people are going to be afraid. The rest of the company, people are going to be very afraid that they're going to be fired. And that's going to decrease innovation. And that's going to also start creating a lot of dysfunctionalities in the company. Yeah, it starts to destroy culture, right? Because people exactly. are fearful, exactly. people don't know who, what's next, there's no transparency. No, I totally agree. And then uh, something very, very important here is that when we do this, and unfortunately, um, for some reason, I cannot pass it. I had to pass it manually. Uh, I created a definition. So the first thing we have to make sure is that we have a clear definition in which direction we want to go. And alignment is very important for companies. So I created a definition of what enterprise agility is. And that's my own definition. This is in the book. And the first part of the definition is quite the standard. We, we basically talk about the capacity for the company to adapt. This is nothing new. But the important thing is the second part, which says without negatively impacting on its organizational health. And in here, I have a very, very clear definition of what organizational health. And for me, organizational health is psychologically safety, how people feel, if they can talk freely in the company, if I, you know, they can just say, I don't like to do that. I don't like to go in this direction. Um, it's, it's about how, how well people can flow in the company. So it's psychological safety plus the creation of a sustainable business value in perpetuity. And for me, the, the word in perpetuity is key because it means that um, we are going to be able to do this today and tomorrow. For example, if you make people work 100 hours to meet a deadline, then that's not sustainable. And yeah, this is something very important. And it's the same way, right, Eric, when um, you start this momentum of change and you're getting really good results and then one of the leaders leave and you stop changing. You know, what happens if you, if you don't get that perpetual motion going? Well, I think it, it, when companies, and I've been working with many banks and companies around the world, and you can see it everywhere. And I think that when we are talking about sustainability, we are talking about many things. First is organizational health, that every decision you make has to be sustainable and has to improve organizational health. But we are talking about the habits or what we call micro habits is everything we do is incorporated. For example, me, I go to the gym every single day as a habit. And I try to make sure, for example, I leave my mobile phone at the entrance, so I really focus on training. And then I try to make sure I have a routine. So what happens in companies is that whenever we change something, we need to make sure that we, we change the culture, but also we change the habits, how these people work in the company and this micro habit and people incorporate it. So that means that people are going to do it naturally. For example, if we are talking about people um, trying to innovate, we are talking about people challenging the culture every day, asking themselves why we're going in this direction, trying to make sure 
they understand what business value is, they challenge the definition of business value, and all our habits that people, they need to nurture it. They need to do it every single day, once and again. And when something is not sustainable, because a leader is pushing in a certain direction, you can see the, you know, they changed leadership, and somehow the company stop moving in that direction, right? Totally. Yep. I think it's very important to have this kind of um, good definition about this kind of um, comprehensive definition, which includes culture, includes habits, includes leadership, includes how I make decisions in the company. And all these things have to be happening at the same time and has to be sustainable. Yeah. And I like, I like how and in your book, it's all you have it, where you say you know, skills can be learned in days. Uh, practices and processes could be learned in weeks, whereas culture is years. And I, I quite like that little diagram you have there. And it's something I've always kind of said, and I've probably repeated on the show quite often. You could learn Scrum in three minutes. You could implement Scrum in, in three weeks. You could see results in three months. But if you want to, and a culture change doesn't require Scrum anymore, it's three years. So it's a long process, isn't it? And I, I like about this is you're wrapping up culture with outcomes. You're not just saying, I'm sprinkling seeds. I'm just sprinkling the seeds and the culture's going to grow. You're saying, no, these are the outcomes we're looking for. Here's the organizational health metrics that we're measuring based on. So when I test this, it should impact this, right? So did you get like a, a case study that made you had an epiphany to, to do it that way? Like what led you to go in this direction? Well, I've been teaching these techniques for years, and there are coaches all around the world that they have been testing these techniques, and, and there are cases in America, there are cases in Europe. Let me tell you uh, something I did in New Zealand, which was quite cool. cool. It was a few years ago, and it's regarding this uh, little framework I showed you. And I didn't, I didn't mention this in the book. I did not have enough space to put all my ideas in there. <laughs> so one day in a company, big company in New Zealand, they wanted to expand the SAP department, the sub department. Mm. And in order to do that, they didn't have enough money. They were paying $1 million New Zealand dollars to this department and they wanted to hire more people. Unfortunately, there were no SAP, more SAP people in New Zealand. They had to bring them from Australia. And it was very, very expensive. So the CEO of this company said, OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fire people in other areas. And with that money, I'm going to hire more SAP people. And that's something that we can see here. If we do that, uh, that's going to decrease organizational health. Yep, definitely. And, and then something that is very important, and I generally work with um, CEOs and people in other companies, we make sure that we take every decision, we put sometimes we can do a dynamic where we note down what's the decision or what's the feature or whatever you're going to do, where in this quadrant is going to be, and then you ask how that's going to improve organizational health. And that decision was very bad. Imagine firing, you start, you start firing people and then people start feeling fear and they feel paralyzed. They don't want to go in any direction. So what I say, okay, I have an idea. Let me take a look at the SAP department. And they told me that the people there were very busy. I could not interrupt them. So I did something very, very simple. I sent an email, I don't like email, but I said that email asking them how many tasks they did and how many times uh, unrelated they did uh, in a day. So how much multitasking they were doing. Mm. And then we realized that they were, oh, for some reason, the screen. Can you see me? Yep, you're fine. OK, great. So uh, for some reason, uh, what happened is that um, they were switching between four or five or six, six tasks, each one, and they were doing a, a lot of multitasking. And we have a lot of research. Microsoft did some piece of research, 
and other big companies, uh, we were able to calculate approximately how much money they were losing for uh, this high multitasking. Imagine for $1, they were investing in this SAP department, they were losing mm -hmm. around 58 cents, more than 50%. Wow, that's quite, that's quite a lot. Yes. So we, we, have, we have some interesting questions coming, coming through. So let's, yeah. um, let's quickly go over here. We've got Kevin Chin has just asked. Um, oh, uh, sorry. One on one. Is any of the technical technical issues? <laughs> there's there's, uh, there's, there's, there's two questions from Kevin, so we'll bring them both at the same time, shall we? Yeah. There we go. So I'm transitioning those in now. There you go. So Kevin says, I'm not sure if I agree that culture necessarily takes years. For example, if you start firing people, culture is going to change very quickly. Good point. And secondly, Kevin's put, conversely, given the right carrot, good culture can be built very quickly. And I guess um, straight back to Kevin, obviously, when we think about what is good, you know, that's a, that's a subjective word, right? So um, what about, Eric, from your point of view, um, when we think about good culture versus bad culture, I guess good culture for me is in line with the objectives and outcomes that a company would, would like. But with, with akin to making moves in a certain period of time, I think I agree with Kevin. Short term, you definitely could actually get some movement, but would you, can you create a culture that's aligned to exponential growth uh, in a short period of time? Or is it a year, a year on year uh, compound? What do you think? Well, so basically what's happening here is that with artificial intelligence, also companies are using short work cycles and we have big data. We, companies are impacting the markets more and more and more and more. And what's happening at the moment is that companies need to adapt very quickly, but human beings are not prepared for that. No. And then imagine you start working on something and something changed, and then you have to work on something else. And if the companies do not have the right practices and the right culture, uh, then we start having very scarce resources of people. Um, companies start struggling, and areas of the companies start fighting for those people or, or even resources, and that increases conflict in the company. This is what I have seen. When companies are not ready for this exponential growth and for this huge amount of massive disruptions, then uh, it's very, very challenging. And some companies develop some culture which looks to be healthy but then, for example, we see with COVID, many companies that they were healthy as soon as COVID started, they went back to the old habits. And this is what happened. So we have to think of something which is sustainable. I'm not saying that you can build something, especially if the culture is very bad, there is a massive gap for improvement. But and again, though, Eric, I'll challenge you. Yes. I challenge you though. So what is a bad culture? So in general, I say that obviously everyone has their private life. Mm. I want to be back home, enjoy if you have kids, your kids. So if you have a massive impact in your private life because of your company's work, then that's not a good culture. The more the culture is going to impact on your private life, from, from my perspective, the worst these companies, is, you know, and I know many companies that they, they, they say they are a good place to work, but then you have to completely change your private life in order to adapt to the company. Yeah. So I guess good culture is just a, uh, what I'm hearing. So good culture in, for your, in your view is, is something that has a good balance between your work and your family life uh, and still achieves the outcomes so in other words, it's a sustainable culture, right? Is that why? Yeah, that it has nice? to be. It has to be sustainable. Obviously, you need to be motivated, mm. and the company need to produce enough market disruptions in, in order to survive 
but also I talk about, in, in fact, yesterday I ran a, a workshop about mental agility. Mm. My idea, and, and this book talks about this, is that if employees in the company do not have enough mental agility, mental agility, from my perspective, is the possibility for a person to see a problem from different perspectives, but also embracing values and principles from that perspective, then if the company people do not have enough mental agility, they are not going to be able to adapt. So that's why I created a framework that is all based on five. And I wanted to show you this. I will try to yeah, share my screen it. again. Yeah, Let's see. Because that's one of my questions actually was in your yeah. book, you mentioned many variations of agility. And I wanted to know, you know what are they and how do they all intersect? Because obviously there's like a five or six and they almost in, they obviously they intersect in, in a certain way, right? Yes. So yeah. from my perspective, well, let me try to show you. I want to show you a particular yeah, go for it. Um, screen that I haven't. Well, why, why Eric's doing that, guys? Uh, for those online, any other questions? Uh, feel free just to put them all, put them all down. Um, yeah. How, how you like us testing our new hypothesis? You know, we're trying out. Uh, so Eric's sharing his screen on Zoom. I'm capturing that and sending it back to you guys. Not sure if it's efficient, but we're working. <laughs> but at least you have the you have the information there, which is the, the it's working. It's working. Yeah, I hope so. So I will share with you guys now. Let's see if it works uh, and how it works. That's a mystery. We're gonna try to find out now. Let me see if you can see a chocolate cake. We can see a chocolate cake. Yep. Yeah, let me see. Oh, that's in Spanish because this is not the one I want to share with you unless you want to. Uh, Espanol? <laughs> well, unless you want to. So basically, uh, from my perspective, whenever you want to um, improve the culture of an organization, you have to consider uh, the idea of mental agility. And mental agility is quite interesting because mental agility means that this person is able to um, reframe problems in order to see problems from different perspectives, you need to make sure that um, you are able to switch from one move from one side to another, and then to mm. see this perspective from different points. And this is connected to enterprise agility. And that's the reason why, okay, I have the right one here, finally. So I'll ask you then, so um, do you have a definition for agility for us? Sorry, say again? Do you have a definition for agility for us? What would be a nice, succinct agility definition? Yeah, so for, for me, this um, mental agility, let me show you these definitions, yes? Mental agility is a capacity, actually, the, one second, I'll show you the screen, is a capacity for a person to see this um, from a different point of view, but this connected to also the definition of business agility, which is try to keep organizational health uh, very high, try to make sure that when we um, think of organizational health, we are also considering that a person that is feeling fear in the company is not mm. feeling safe, then is less flexible to change. And we have a lot of research about that. We know how the amygdala, which is mm. in the center of the brain works. And then, okay, the cake is there. Can we see the cake? We can see the cake, yes. Okay, that's a very good start. Every, so the, everyone, everyone online enjoying some cake? <laughs> it's low in sugar, very low in sugar, okay? <laughs> so this is a cake. So people mm. generally try to eat a cake vertically, right? And here we have mm. five different kinds of um, agility. The first one is mental agility. It's at the very bottom. That is this ability for people to reframe problems and that increases something called neuroplasticity, which is how the neurons connect. And this is very, very important. If people do not have adequate levels of uh, neuroplasticity in the organization, mm. then they're not gonna be able to adapt to the market disruptions. Then the second level we have is social agility, which is how people connect in the company and physical or virtual environment and how the environment impact on people. Nice. Then we have outcomes agility, Imagine your company is producing shoes and then they start to bring in some shoes from some country from China, very cheap. Mm. And suddenly you realize that you don't have to, you, you know, it's very bad for you to keep producing shoes. So you change direction and you say, okay, now I'm gonna start producing mobile phones. 
So this change in the strategy means that leadership has to be engaged. People have to be engaged also because if you suddenly change direction, people are going to be afraid that they're going to lose their positions. And also we have to have some um, agility in terms of budgeting. Instead of uh, having the budget for the whole year, you need to make sure we completely reframe and change the vision and mission for the company. You, you go in a different direction. So yeah. basically outcomes agility is how you adjust the strategy without impacting on organizational health. Then we have a structural agility, which is how you change your procedures. This is something that everyone can understand. And uh, we have many, many techniques. Uh, for example, if we are gonna impact on some, some group of people, then we make sure we involve those, this group of people into the definition. You, help, you know, they can help us define or create the new roles and the new procedures. And then finally, we have technical agility. Love but the most yeah. important thing here is, in, is what I call a powerful strategy. When we want to create a change plan or try to influence a culture, we need to cut the cake. We cannot eat just the chocolate at the top, which is what the companies generally do. They yeah. just like chocolate and eat the, just eat the technical agility, thinking that that's going to improve the whole organization. We need to cut the cake uh, vertically, which means that each of these um, each of these change plans that you have in your mind, you need to make sure that they touch in each of these levels. At least the plan should consider that uh, you need to build up on, on these five things, right? But Eric, are you telling me that if, I, if I'm a leader and I, I implement Scrum, is that not enough? I thought Scrum was all I needed to do. Especially if you have the latest guide, <laughs> right? Oh, exactly. <laughs> I'm just following the guide. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's all I do. I, I'm starting to worry about my own coaching now. This is, this is terrible. Oh, I'm sorry. Carry on. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, you probably know that change is complex. Change yeah. involves some social patterns. I remember a few years ago, I was having a conversation with someone from America, from New York, from the Boston Consultancy Group. And mm -hmm. Then I suggested some ideas. I don't know, somehow after a few months, they implemented those ideas. I don't know if it was because I suggested that. But I said the environment, just the environment impacts on people. So what they did is mm -hmm. they put um, a device, a sensor to each employee. And they, for a few weeks, they check how people move in the office. And mm -hmm. then they basically change the environment, the physical environment, to make sure that people collide, bump into each other more frequently, not physically, right? But the idea, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they didn't bump physically into each other. But the idea- I, I, that, I was assuming so, I was assuming so. <laughs> <laughs> the idea here is that if people come across more frequently bump into each other, information mm -hmm. flows better in the company. So they change the environment to make sure that information flows better and if information flows better at the end of the day everyone um, knows what to do uh, so just by changing the environment they didn't require many meetings during that one day everyone was kept up to date etc 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 so when we create a change strategy we can do just something small in the software team that we know very how it works or we can create a powerful strategy and in order to create a powerful strategy we need to consider these five different types of agility yeah and, and uh, i like what you said there because um, obviously covid19 hit most of the world pretty hard but one of the reflections i had afterwards when i think i had six or seven teams at the time of covid and what happened was we all went online and um it was very interesting because at the end of covid we reduced all our meetings we had created better connections with our families. I had higher productivity gains. And I had one comment from one member that really stuck with me. And he said that I feel like we're more closer as a team than ever before. And I said, why do you think that is? And he said, I think because we've actually been a team and I haven't been like part of all these other teams. It's just been us six people for the last three months. And it's been magical. And I was like, that's awesome. You know, and obviously being at home with his family, it's been good. And um, since going back to the office, a lot of people have been drifting off and leaving the company because they, it's like 
I give this example. If I give you a beer and then take it away from you, you've lost something, right? But if I never give you a beer, you never actually had it in the first place. You don't worry. But they've been given something magical, some team culture that they've never had before, some empowerment they've never had before. They chose all their own tools. Everything was beautiful. And now we're taking it away. Are you seeing a similar impact where you are? Well, I see two things. First, our company where they do this remote work and they have a deadline. So they say, okay, when COVID is over, we go back to the office. What I say is, as the guys, maybe they can go back to the office twice a week or three times a yeah. week, you know, and you have to ask each team. On the other side, yeah, this is quite interesting as yesterday, one of the, in, during this workshop I did about mental agility and all these types of agility, I asked people to solve a problem that most of coaches are asking me around the world is people are working longer hours mm -hmm. because obviously when you work from home, you don't have all the information that you need. And virtually, you cannot get that information. When you're in the office, you are sitting, you are talking to people, you can see uh, interactions and see what's happening, but you don't have it remotely. So what's happening is we have a, a piece of research that shows first that your brain is trying to reconnect what is missing and then you spend a lot of uh, energy at doing that. And mm -hmm. also, obviously, some things are broken when you work from home. It's not uh, We are not as lucky as you. And then people feel very tired. In many parts of the world, people are telling me, Eric, I'm very, very, we're very tired uh, from working from home. And we are working longer, longer hours as people have the feeling that they need to show other people that they are producing, they try to produce more. Yeah. And this is not sustainable. So one of the exercises we did yesterday in the workshop was using these five different types of agility, create a powerful strategy that is going to help the guys do that. For example, technical agility, they could check if the software has quite quality, why people have to work more. Structural agility, mm. do they have the right structures and procedures? Then for example, social agility, we have tools that recreate the social environment where people can see how they are moving inside the virtual company. And mental agility is reframe the problem, for example, to try to see how uh, they're going to solve a problem from a different perspective. But this is something also around the world that some companies are not finding the way and people start feeling tired too. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely uh, pros and cons. I, I'll, I'll definitely give you that. And I, I, you reminded me of a, of a journal that I read around work from home prior to COVID. I think it was about two or three years ago. And it was um, working from home was more productive because people felt guilty for working from home, so they actually worked more hours. Yes. And that, and I thought is, that was quite interesting. Yes, people generally mm. uh, work more hours. And let me share something with mm. you, which is uh, the next one. And this is something I wrote two or three years ago, but still, still in the same way. This is, I'm grabbing this from a presentation and this some time ago. So basically when, my recommendation is when you have people that are working from home, uh, we do what we call rebuild the social environment. Cool. So when yeah. you are in the social environment in the office, you have people, what we call public information radiators that can become kind of visual uh, things that you can see everywhere on the walls, physical things. You have visual uh, social interactions, how people interact. And this is key because for example, imagine that you see a member of your team meeting an expert on something on database for example next time you have a problem with the database instantly inst instead of asking uh, the 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 expert you are asked you're going to ask the person from your team this is because your brain recorded this connection between the member of your team and the database experts so uh, your brain is trying to find an easy way to solve a problem for example another day you see someone from your team talking to the ceo and then you have a question about the strategy, you are not going to talk to the CEO, you're going to talk to that member of the team. And yep. this is some very silly, but it, it shortened the, the, the cycle loops. So visual uh, social interaction, we also have, we can recognize um, when we're in the environment, visible uh, facial expressions, you see mm. people fighting and you know, okay, something is wrong here. Especially if you release a product 
a few minutes before. Then you have um, the actions, how people move in the office. And what we need is to rebuild this office to try to recreate that with Zoom or other tools. You just recreate one dimension. You see the face of that person. And in fact, we have a piece of research. I read it three months ago where it says that when you use just Zoom and you see the face of other people and you are in meetings, your brain is trying to recreate this social environment and it's spending a lot of energy. So we have tools which basically allow us to um, have the virtual, a virtual environment which replicate the physical environment. And I did a very interesting experiment in 2016. I was helping an airline in Latin America and we did is mm. uh, what we did is we put cameras everywhere in the rooms and Kanbans and everything and we connected it with a piece of software this case case is Sokoko but there are more uh, that you can find and we recreate in that piece of software the environment so where you could see when people moved in the office you can we could see it here and then when you click nice. in one room uh, you open the room and then you could see all the cameras and, and, and you don't know if the person is virtual or is in there. So, so you can also see if everyone is going to a room and then you can see that, then you're going to go to that room physically or virtually. So we need to recreate the, and this is something I, I've been talking for three years already, mm. is to recreate the, the social environment in order to produce kind of similar experience. And it worked very, very well with this client at that time. I actually really like the software. It's actually pretty, pretty cool, actually. Uh, I haven't been able to implement it anywhere so far, but I actually, I really do rate it. I also found a little workaround. I was working with a, a, a vendor client and um, I didn't realize the first couple of meetings, but they all had a um, Zoom background of where they sat in the office. Uh-huh, good. And because obviously they didn't have green screens, like my wonderful green screen behind me like this, um, you could pick up on it was fake. But I thought it was genius because what they've done is they've replicated where they sat in the office so that you can connect where they are in the office, even though they're at home. Yeah, which makes things easier for your brain. Your yeah. brain is trying to imagine and to deduct. Your brain is looking at things all the time and trying to deduct, okay, what's happening here? There is fear. You know, I should feel like uh, in which mode I should feel. I should be in a productive way. I should feel protected. How I should feel here? Should I communicate? No. He's trying to, the brain is trying to deduct all the time what's happening. And this is a great thing to do because obviously it helps people feel better at connect. Or at least the connection is going to be better between people. Yeah. Why, yeah. Why is trust so important for change? Well, let, let's try to analyze it from um, the physical point of view. Your brain, when you don't don't, do not trust someone, then you get into a kind of protective mode and that activates an area of the brain, which is called the amygdala, which releases a lot of hormones into your brain. Um, it puts you in a kind of fight or flight mode. And when, if you don't trust someone, you don't share that much information and then you, you basically do not care that much about that person. And companies are all about the quality of these conversations. Yeah. So when there is no trust, the, what we call social density, how information flows in the company decreases and then decreases innovation and uh, decreases business value uh, that you can produce. And also uh, you increase bureaucracy because people start covering their ass and sending emails just to make sure that, you know, I told you that day that it was not possible to do that and this kind of yeah. things. And we have an increase in complexity in companies just for the fact, because we do not trust each other. I totally agree. And there was a really good point in your book. I, I, um, I, I think it's my takeaway point. So I've come to the end of our hour. My takeaway point from your book was probably not something you may have expected, but you wrote a little triangle around business agility and the three impacts to changing business agility, right? Yes. The restructure. Yep. Cool. That's what my thesis was on. Organization was redesign. Totally agree with that. And there was culture change, people. Totally agree with that. But the one thing that I did not see coming, I, I, I had to spend a good day and a half reflecting on, 
was not a digital transformation. You said specifically it was a technology transformation to move the almost the barrier of entry of the task down the scale so that it's easier to be done. And I thought that was actually really good because you could get an adaptive, flexible, responsive organization just by implementing technology that no longer requires like high motivation. It actually requires a low motivation, almost automated task. And I thought that was really cool. Do you want to expand on that a little bit? Because I thought that was really good. Yes. So basically, I talk about habits also, and I teach about habits. The idea is that, yeah, people really need high motivation to do things that are hard. If I need to do something which is very hard, I need high motivation. But then when we are talking about companies, um, for example, automation and other things, we can automate things and then we're going to make life easier for these people, which means that when we are, for example, in a company's transformation, we also need to take a look at th these micro habits. If you change something very, a piece of technology or whatever you change in the company, and you make sure that that thing that you change, it makes uh, life easy for people, then they do not require much motivation to do that. And then people can save this motivation uh, for something else. And there is a connection between this and flexibility in the company. Um, I think it's a very extensive topic to talk, but I think it's very, very important that people understand that if we make um, things easy for people, then first people are going to save that energy for something else, maybe for being able to adapt to other things. But motivation is very important, but also we need to understand why we need motivation for to do something. Why, for example, we need to be motivated to repair a piece of software that is full of bugs. Why you need to be more, be more, nobody is motivated to do that, right? Uh, I, I'm hoping some people love incident management, but yeah. I, yeah there, I, are, I there are people that, yeah, I met a few people probably. That's the point. <laughs> um, no, I, I just want to, if, if anyone wants to um, buy your book, it's over on Amazon, correct? I actually bought the Audible, by the way. I thought the Audible was easier for me. Um, but you I, know, you can, you can also uh, see the, all the pictures of the book are downloaded into the audiobook, as many people do not know. Yeah, no, and Audible has just updated it. I think it's this year sometime that you can actually get it from the mobile app, which I, I find so much easier. Yeah, and sure. um, that's actually where I found that triangle and I properly understood it. I thought that's, that's the key bit of information that I think I'll be taking away from the book is actually if you have, if you're struggling, there's a triangle, right? You could change one dimension. If you're struggling with motivation, then make it simpler. And that will allow flexibility. If you want to change for adaptive organizations, you need to change the structure of how the work's created. I love that. And if you want long-term goals, then I think the culture change makes more, more sense as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, yes. And something important, Michael, is that mm. people generally imagine, as I see that in banks, they have like 100 coaches, 200 coaches. They believe that, you know, if I'm going to run a marathon and I have more people, I'm going to go faster. And I always say, what if you could change a minimal thing in the company and that's going to create uh, the maximum impact? What mm -hmm. about taking a different approach? Uh, for example, I did in the book about micro habit. Change a habit, and I show you a couple of examples where that tiny habit have a massive impact. So what about instead of having massive backlog of, of transformation teams and areas of the company just focus on, on transformation, then we shall have a backlog where we put first tiny things we can do in the company that's gonna have a massive impact, positive impact in organizational health and also um, in uh, the way we create innovation and we deliver business value. Yeah, and it's interesting you say about banks. It's not just banks. I, I, I don't know if it's just over in Australia and New Zealand, that's where I, I specialize in, but I'm finding, I gave a, a, an example. Someone called me up, I think about three weeks ago, and said, oh, Michael, we have 15 teams. So can, can you tell me, how do we scale up to 15 Scrum Masters? 
So I, I had this like in my mind, like, why yeah. do you want one team per scrum? Are your teams fifty people? Like, oh no, our teams are five people each. And they're like, okay, you don't need fifteen scrum masters. Uh, I speak, I think I spend most of my time recommending to downgrade your scrum masters. You're not going to go any faster by having a hundred scrum masters, two hundred coaches. If you just make small little changes, you're actually going to have a bigger impact and a much greater ROI. Are you seeing a similar uh, thing over your way, over in Thailand and Hong Kong? Uh, not really. I think it's, it depends on the company. But the, no, we're joking. <laughs> it <laughs> happens everywhere. It happens everywhere, Michael. You cannot imagine. Yeah. People love complex things. And the bigger the company, the, the bigger the plan it is. Also, I imagine it is because some people want to get their bonuses and uh, more prestige. Yeah. And they generally go for complex things. But also our brain always try to find it, it, you need to, that's why I focus on my framework. I focus on mental agility. Nice. We need to make sure that everything we do is simple and simplicity is an art that we need to master and we need to master every single day. And I say, uh, yesterday I had around the workshop, I had like 100, 90 or 100 uh, coaches and I told them, listen, you need to teach your customers how to embrace this mental agility, how to make things simple. But you have to try it with yourself. It's not that I do it, but, you know, with you, but I do it with, I don't do it with me. And I asked the guys, how many of the techniques, guys, you use, you use it with you? Mm. Yeah. And we are easy at recommending things massive plans and massive things, but do you really at home do that with you? Oh, and, and that's what I love. It was a comment. Um, it was Erica. Um, she's from Auckland, Agile coach there. Great. Shout out to Erica. And um, she introduced me. It's probably widely used, but she's the first person who really made me think, are we drinking our own champagne? Mm. Right? And I love that statement. And I guess I've, I probably ignored it till then. And I thought, well, we must be, right? Why would we be recommending all these things if we're not doing them at home? I mean, so I, I renovate and build houses and my kids have a Kanban board. I do it all in uh, the same framework I use for delivering a SaaS upgrade or, uh, you know, uh, finance stuff. I, it doesn't bother me. I have exactly the same framework. Uh, what works for me. But I find that I'm seeing coaches who don't even like, they don't even have their own to-do list and they refuse to have visibility of the changes that they want to actually focus on next and if you can't even do that as a coach yourself how do you expect for other people to believe that it's the right way of doing things well i'm gonna be very mean but something happened in hong kong is that there were a lot of people with zero experience in in agile and suddenly their cvs mm. uh, they move into this agile world world and all of them were agile coaches and uh, I'm not talking about people who just try to learn, constantly learn and improve. There are many people mm -hmm. that are more, uh, coming from other backgrounds and they are trying to improve. And I appreciate that. People mm -hmm. try to learn and try, people try to improve. But also we have to see that in this industry, agile coaching is quite profitable. You can make some money, but also you have people coming from other areas and trying to understand this quite quickly and then focusing on processes and complexity. And sometimes you have to work with those people. And then you come across people who do not practice anything of what they recommend to the client. Yeah, and, and Eric, I, give it, I, I, lo I love that. That's perfect. It's very profitable. And to be honest, 95% of this industry is overpaid. They really are. And what frustrates me about the visibility side of things is if you want $1,000 a day, $2,000 a day, where is the customer value you are actually increasing? Show me the ROI. And one of, the, um, one of my clients once said to me, I need, I need two people in for six months for these four teams. I said, what's the outcome you're looking to achieve? I said, ah, oh, we want Scrum. I said, awesome. Um, I require 14 days for one person and um, six weeks part-time for another person. 
And they were flabbergasted. They had Scrum up and running. They were continuously improving by themselves. If Scrum's all you want, you don't require someone for six months. It's, it's not a requirement. If you want to restructure around the work, maybe that's a little bit different. But actual Scrum mastery to get Scrum up and running, if that's all you want, very simple, very cheap um, for the right person. But a whole bunch of contractors are very happy to stay in a role and make their role, what's the word I'm looking for? Make their role needed. And I think the whole point of a Scrum Master or a coach or whatever you call yourself now is to make yourself redundant as soon as possible. So that's the KPI I give to myself. How quickly can I get these people up and running so they don't require me anymore? And that's what I, that's what I love to do. So I, 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 I love that. I do have one more question for you. Yes, yeah, sure. Finishing up. Um, so we've got, where is, where is that gone? So Gordon says, how do you convince finance to be agile? And the reason why I've chosen that question is because it's quite common. People, I mean, I'm an ex-accountant, so I don't get this. I, I'm like, what? that's easy, right? Just show them the figures. But um, from your point of view, finance, is that a problem? Well, problem? first of all, thank you, Gordon. Uh, the <laughs> first part of the question, I see how do you convince someone to do something I, I think it's very difficult to convince someone, unless it's your couple, is someone you share time with. Uh, so I recommend a different strategy. Hmm. Instead of convincing someone to do something, I just say, okay, if you need to convince someone to do something, it's because that, those people do not want to change. Unfortunately, we do not have time today. I wish we had more time. I have- Yeah, we're out of time. We have time. No, we've run out of time. Oh, okay, okay. Because otherwise, I would show you the pyramid of the change journey, which is a framework to to change mindset. But basically, what I say, if people, um, if you have to, to just convince people to change it, they do not want to change. So try to start first with some micro habits in order to change some tiny things. Second, make sure leadership is on board to make sure that uh, they have a proper vision and mission. And then uh, this happened in New Zealand, a, a bank, I was helping a bank, and then the financial area, they never worked together, never. And they had to work together to do something. And the key point here was that they were not able to solve the problem unless they worked together. So they came back to me and said, okay, now we have to work together. So how, how we can do that? So we defined some initial working agreement, but I would say, to Gordon that do not try to make people lives because they are not gonna like you. Try to make sure if there is a tiny habit first and then work with leadership to make sure that they have the need to do that. And then you need to identify why people do not want to do it. It's mainly because they are feeling that they're gonna lose prestige, uh, they're gonna lose their jobs or there is some uncertainty. So this is the kind of thing you need to solve first. When you see people saying, I don't care about the change, I don't care about you, that means generally is that I want to protect where I am. If you show me that it's worth to do whatever you want and I'm gonna get more prestige and I'm gonna get more power or opportunities, then I'm gonna go in that direction. And But you have to teach me how to do it. And this is yeah. how I would probably do it. Yeah, no, I, 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 totally, I totally agree. And for finance, put, you know, from my point of view, if you show me that I'm going to get more value quicker and I'm going to, get, I'm going to reduce my risks, I, I'm never going to say no. Please break things down into smaller sprints or quarterly deliverables. Of course, I want those benefit realizations faster. Of course, I want higher internal red returns. Of course, I want higher ROIs. Um, yeah, you show me that. You can do whatever you like. I'll give you. I'll, I'll let you draw down your funds quarterly for all I care. But yeah, and also good. there is something important you said, Michael, is about the language. It, yeah, because if you, you, you got to connect use the right, right people, right? Yeah, and that's one thing that um, people who know me probably know. Obviously, accounting background, strategy is my focus. Organizational redesign is, is what I love doing. And if you come at me with, oh, uh, it's all about sprinting seeds. It's all about the fluffy. All about the non-measurable. I'm gonna just throw out the window and say that's just nonsense. Please go away. If I'm saying that, and I do call myself a coach, 
I, I do I do coaching. I have I have coaching methods I use. So I say I am a coach. But if you say that that's what you do, most executives are going to go. That's that's great. I think I'll get back to you on on the strategy you, you're putting forward. Um, they will take you seriously. You have to use the right language that actually is empathetic to the person you're talking to. I love that. Yes, you know, and also it's important because in the book, in the last part, I talk about the, the, the ELSA change model that basically we have a lot of research. We have done a lot of research and we see how we can use a framework that just by changing language, can, people can change habits. Love it. Love it. And I um, hope that answers the question, Gordon. I, I, I think um, it's something that you could do a whole segment on finance and HR. I and mean, there's a reason why I see Agile. <laughs> yes. There's a reason why I see Agile how has like, um, you know, an Agile, Agile finance course, an Agile HR course, because they're kind of the two main ones people raise in not only of these. Um, well, but let, let, me tell you, let me tell you something. That's why I believe that if you teach certain techniques to those people and you increase the mental agility on those people, um, they are going to be able to see what your problems are. Yeah. And that's why it's very difficult. You know, you give a, a problem to a software team, the same problem to people who studied economics and the same problem to a painter. And then those three people are going to come up with different ideas. This is because what you studied in your life change the way you think and also uh, give you some framework for developing solutions. Mm. And in order to, to do the, to change the way that people come up to different solutions, you need the game to make sure you master reframing, uh, you make sure that you, you change certain things in the way they think in a way that they feel comfortable with that, that they are able to reframe the problems. Otherwise, mm. finance in, an, in a software team or in an, another team, or even if you have lawyers, that makes things worse in terms uh, of integrating them into the team. I'm not saying they are and, bad people, right? No, <laughs> and they're not bad people. And this is what's actually really interesting. And we have to not go into this, but just to lay a seed. There you go, I'm laying seeds now. To lay a seed for next time. I, I think we need to chat more. <laughs> I think we need to chat more. I've got like 20 more questions. So I think we'll, we're going to, I'm going to get you back on this show in, uh, after Christmas. Thank you, Mike. Um, this has been great. Um, but when you think about it, Scrum was designed. It was designed for software. I, I, don't, I can't imagine anyone saying it didn't, right? Jeff got that uh, framework. He built it up from a 1980s Harvard Business Review document. He edited it for software development. It's software. Why... Do people get confused why you know putting scrum in a finance team or scrum in a hr team why do you think they're going to have problems with that when this structure was designed for linear um software developers who think in a certain way of course you have problems that's why things should be i think we spoke on linkedin a little while ago uh in a, in a thread and we said exactly that if you if you're still using scrum a certain period later you're probably not doing it pro properly, right? You should be getting out of Scrum. You know, it should be bespoke to your own team, your own environment. And I think what we're tending to find with coaches and Scrum masters is they want to do it this way. And if you want to get to business agility, you can't be bringing in software to a strategy team, et cetera. Yes, and I think this is important. And I, I've been heavily criticized for saying, if you are, have been doing a Scrum for a long time and you still need the guidance of the, the new Scrum Guide that for some people brings value, but you have been doing it for ages and then you have retrospectives. Come on, you cannot tell me that you discover new ways of doing things. And when I, when I did the workshop yesterday that we were using certain techniques to create these powerful plans, mm -hmm. I told all the guys uh, that all the solutions, they couldn't use a Scrum or any well-known framework. They had to solve the problems in a different way. And they struggled for half an hour until they got it. But there, there, there is a, a, a world outside there. You have more techniques coming from sociology, coming from psychology. You have things you can copy from other companies. There are a million of things. Oh. The, the thing I appreciate about the Scrum is reflecting. This is great. Reflecting on good quality. This is key things. One of the main frameworks I actually promote is called the orchestra model, right? And when I recommended that to someone, a coach piped up and said, 
Oh, that's Scrum. No, it's not. It's an orchestral model. It, it's a specific model for delivering work uh, based on strategy. It's nothing to do with, with, with Scrum. But then you realize that in the world, especially in our world, if you even mention iterations at all, our oh, Scrum owns that. That's Scrum. Uh, I was a guy in the UK I was talking to on LinkedIn, and I had to stop talking to him because he basically was saying that everything that's good is Scrum and everything that's bad is not Scrum. I, I was baffled by that comment, especially from a coach. And um, so I, I think we, we'll have to stop because I think otherwise we'll carry on. But um, I've had a fantastic time. I hope you have. What's your, what, do you want to give me a reflection? What's your reflection on the last hour and 10 minutes? Yes, so my reflection is that if you want to understand how things work in a company, you need to see that there are different mindsets and you need to make sure you talk to different mindsets in different ways and you provide different frameworks for different people and different uh, also practices for different people. I I love it. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Mike. That's been awesome. So um, to everyone out there in the agile agility world, thank you very much for listening. I know we went over time. I do apologize. Bad facilitation, Michael. Bad facilitation, Michael. My reflection from today, I think, is that I'm starting to grow as a coach by meeting some awesome people outside of my circle and realizing that there are some things that are different out there. doesn't mean they're bad. There are some things that I'm finding are fantastic tools with, with, with subset ideals that I didn't know about. And that's where I'm, I find the true value. Uh, I'd like to thank Eric for coming on the show today. It has been fantastic. I'm definitely going to grab him back because that was, uh, I have too many questions. <laughs> um, so I'm going to um, say good night to everyone or good morning. And um, thank you very much for listening. Yeah, everyone have a good night. Thank you.